Introduce yourself and where you work. I'm uh, Pamela Hess. I'm the Pentagon correspondent for United Press International. I've been at the Pentagon for UPI since May, um, sorry, March of 1999, and I did a brief sojourn at the White House for about six months. Okay. And can you tell me uh, kind of your routine where you get your news from every day? Sure. <clears throat> I'm the, as the Pentagon correspondent, it's my job to sort of cover the day in, day out of what's going on at the Pentagon. Uh, the most of the last two years has been taken up with almost daily briefings at the Pentagon uh, because of the two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan war, so they've been doing those with some frequency. Uh, so mostly it, it starts there and uh, you're sort of driven by the day's events as to where things go. Um, once in a while as a beat reporter, because you have this sort of daily requirement of what you need to do, which is to capture on the record what it is that they're saying, sort of that first blush of history. Um, creating a historical record of this is what they said on this day about this subject, um, you have limited amounts of time to do other stuff. But those other things do pop up, which are stories, we call them enterprise stories, stories that you sort of generate on your own and do on your own. Those, those are actually more fun, and we all like to do them more. Um, but they're also sort of scary and hard to do because you don't know where they're going to come from and you don't know where they're going to go. Um, but my bread and butter is what's going on at the Pentagon that day. It's definitely not rewriting press releases and you don't just take verbatim what they say and say it unless it's some very short sort of news article just saying Rumsfeld said this on this day. <clears throat> you definitely run it through filters and you get people who know things to comment and you talk to folks on background, which is you sort of walk around the building and find people that are involved that maybe don't want to um, have their names appear in print but are, are willing to talk to you a little bit to pro provide some context or some history to what you're doing and, and then you put that all together in a story. Okay, and um, how does the uh, New York Times and Washington Post, um, what they cover, do you follow what they're covering and how does that affect the balance? Yeah, the New York Times and the Washington Post actually tend to set the agenda for most daily news reporters and they're very good uh, for the most part, um, the reporters are, are the best. That's how they get to be there, because they become the best and then they get hired. Um, and at the same time, these are sort of the hometown newspapers of the most powerful people in the country, so they are what get read. It's almost a, 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 a circle. Um, this is not to say that every important news story or every great news story, even the best journalism, appears in these journals, but they have the most powerful readership, and so it does set the agenda. So that stuff becomes, this is what this is what we're going to talk about this day, and then Rumsfeld will respond to something that was in the paper, and then it generates what we what, what we end up writing. So do you find that it's hard to do an enterprising story that's outside of that bounds that's already been covered? Um, it's, it's hard to beat the Washington Post and the New York Times at their own game. Um, they have <clears throat> great sources, um, and the re one of the reasons that they have great sources is because they're so powerful and because people will give them information that they wouldn't give to me because, among the reasons, uh, they will get read more widely and by people who make a difference. And you can be sure that if your, if, if your issue is going to appear in the New York Times, it's going to become an issue that gets talked about in Washington. So people that leak um, would tend to leak to those two papers. Uh, so it's so for those great big stories of moment, um, I think you have to the big papers are going to get them just because news is um, news isn't just reporters going out and and pulling what bits of information are out there. It's manipulated by people who want their particular side of the story out. And so, then it's up to reporters to make sure that they get it balanced and understand the agenda of the people that are giving them information. But um, but make no mistake about it, everyone that talks to you has an agenda and you just you need to figure out what that is. So that said, um, the great big stories, uh, they tend to corner the market on. Um, and you can, do, you can do some good work in advancing stuff, um, but there's lots of tons of stuff. I mean, the Pentagon spends $400 billion a year, and so there's just worlds of stuff that can happen, that, that you can write about, that nobody else is writing about, that's important, um, that affects lives, that affects huge amounts of money. But there is sort of this sense that if, no matter how important your story is or how great it is or how exclusive it is, if it doesn't ultimately get picked up by one of the other big papers and they don't pursue it, your story just tends to die. So it might be a great one-day story, but if it doesn't really capture the attention of the, the big editors, then, then it's done. So <coughs> do you see um, or experience any um, peer pressure from your 
fellow correspondents that when you try to go outside of the bounds or even from the government, flack directly from them. Certainly not from certainly not from colleagues. There's, I okay, think. Okay, let me just uh, preface that when I ask a question, I'll try to phrase it so that when you answer, I'll be able to take my my question. Uh, question. Okay. okay. Um, I don't uh, reporters. I don't think get a lot of pressure from other reporters not to pursue stories. Um, you do get pressure from government flax not to do that. Um, and every once in a while, the government official will call you and say, I, we'd like you not to be working on that story, and here's why. And sometimes you agree with it. Um, you agree to their demands, because sometimes they offer you a better deal. Well, when, when we're ready for this to come out, I'll give you the exclusive on it. Or here's why we don't want this. I, I remember there was one story many years ago that I worked on that um, I had had, <clears throat> I got from three uh, different sources that were in a closed door meeting in the tank in the Pentagon, and one general in there had said, I think this was almost a direct quote, but something along the lines of America's going to have to get over its, um, its fear of casualties. And this was well before uh, Kosovo, even. Um, at any rate, I was getting ready to write this story because it was interesting, and it wasn't just about, it wasn't just about that, but it was this idea that the military was saying, you know, we can't support this idea that we have to have casualty-free wars. We, we, we can't fight that way. And if we're going to use the military, we're going to have to accept greater casualties. So this is, of course, a very important story. Um, a, a, a general that outranked that general, who I actually had a very good relationship with, um, who I could talk to off the record or on background frequently, called me and asked me not to report that story. And and I didn't. And the reason that I didn't was, was twofold. Um, number one, I needed this second general more than I needed that story. And number two, I thought he made a great um, I thought he made a great point, which is if they can't speak their minds in these closed door meetings, then we're really robbing the Pentagon of its ability to do its job. That's not something that, that that's not a philosophy I would describe to you generally, but I thought in that case it made perfect sense that this was an intellectual discussion and people need to be able to have those. Doesn't mean I'm not going to try to find out what they say in them, um, but on a case by case basis, I think reporters can be negotiated with out of stories. And I don't really have any regrets about that one. Um, Okay. Although that general did go on to die in a plane crash, and so I can't, can't use him anymore. <laughs> hey, Marty. Okay. Um, uh, can you talk about, you know, the striving to be objective and, you know, taking on all these pieces of information and what kind of editorial process and biases do you have to have in that process? Um, on the issue of bias in journalism, it's, I think it's very difficult for any reporter to be completely free of bias. And I also think that there's an argument to be made for bias in journalism. I think that um, some of the best journalists uh, out there, the ones who really break great stories, are those that have a particular passion about a subject, and that passion is probably coming from a political point of view um, or, or an issue point of view. And it's because they really care significantly about it that they go out and pursue it and don't get turned back and, and so I think that um, <laughs> I think hey okay. I think that um, bias in general sorry that not work sorry. Um, no I think I, I got what I needed okay. from the first part um, there and the yeah, second part of the question is how do I remain objective yeah um, how there's a pat answer for how reporters remain objective and and one of them is that that writing news articles is a it's a it's it's almost a form it's a formula there's a skill to it you answer the five w's you make sure that you talk to people on one side and talk to people on the other um, you can show a little bit of bias by choosing to speak to smarter people on one side and dumber people on another uh, people who won't make as good a case for it um, but this is where editors come in, and they should, you know, the edit, it's really the editor's job to keep their eye on reporters. For, for my purposes, I've been covering national security in the Pentagon for 10 years, and in that time, I've become so familiar with, with all the sides of, of the issues that I've covered. And, I mean, these aren't idiots that aren't. That are, that are arguing these things out, and there are reasonable arguments for every side. And so what I have found to be 
um, I, in my situation is that I really I really don't have a strong personal view about a lot of the things. I can see all the sides and and I, I feel for me I feel like journalism is, is teaching. I want to kind of lay it out for somebody who doesn't know anything. So the, you know these are the benefits and disadvantages of each side. So. So talk a little bit about the difficulties associated with covering an, an issue like Iraq that spans the diplomatic, mm -hmm. political, and military aspects. Um, covering uh, the war and the lead up to Iraq and then the war itself uh, was a, a huge challenge and um, especially for me because I'm one person at our Pentagon Bureau and so I, I had to be responsible for for all parts of it, which is you know the personnel, the people that were being led up to it, the the war planning, all of the intel that we could gather from you know what we could ask about at Pentagon briefings or and, and offline, and then the war itself. So I mean it's a it was a it's a it's a huge job and just the volume of information. Um, I think that one of the things that made covering the Iraq War so difficult is that much of the information that supported the case for war in the administration's eyes was classified. And so all they had to say whenever you asked about it was, that's classified, we can't tell you. So it was sort of like a, you know, you're just going to have to trust us kind of thing. And unless you have someone on the inside who is willing to um, compromise themselves professionally, potentially get fired, potentially go to jail to share some classified information with you, you're kind of up against a wall. And the best that you can do is sort of say, this is what they said on this day, this is what we know up to this point, and, um, and just kind of lay it out there. Uh, I, one of the things that um, struck me and, and what I came out of the pre-war prep with a pretty clear feeling for was at least from the Pentagon. We asked time and again at the Pentagon, uh, at the Pentagon briefings, if the threat from Iraq was imminent, um, if it was any more imminent now than it had been prior to September 11th, uh, what changed on, what, what was the difference in intelligence gathered between September 10th and September 12th? And the uh, answer that we got time and again from Rumsfeld ultimately at the end of long bouts of questioning was the sense that the threat against the United States had not changed so much as the sense of vulnerability. Um, and so, for my part, as, as the war, as we led up to the war, I wasn't so personally convinced that the intelligence suggested that there needed to be a war. But I did understand that they felt like the level of U.S. vulnerability um, was such that the intelligence that did exist suggested that you needed a war. I'm not sure if that really makes sense, but um, if you look at threat, I mean, threat is threat is not just objective, but it's also your perception of what the threat is and how vulnerable you feel. And that half of the equation um, really exploded after September 11th and, and thereafter. So it's not to say that that there isn't a lot of other stuff that that went into it, and I think that um, the stuff that's going on in the news uh, with the 9-11 commissions and, and the nexus with Iraq there uh, isn't casting a, a, a great and interesting light on it. But, but from my perspective at the Pentagon, I didn't ever get the sense that the intelligence had suddenly suggested that Iraq was an imminent threat, but rather that the United States didn't want to risk being wrong about it. The print reporters and the television reporters mm -hmm. and the new, and the briefings. Yeah, there's a huge difference between print and television reporters and the briefings, and um, most of the differences in, in television production time. They need to know, and at a point early in the day, what their package is going to be that night. Barring any real breaking news, they're already pulling together what they think the story of the day is, and that's largely driven, from my understanding, by what was big in the newspapers that morning. So when when uh, television reporters go into a briefing, they usually sit in the front row because they need to get their mugs on, on TV, and they ask a question that is designed to feed into a news package that they're putting together that night. Um, as a print reporter, and especially working for whom I work, where um, they really give me a lot of, of freedom, I'm allowed to sort of sit and listen and, and see if there is any new news going on, if there's something that he feels like talking about, or if there's something that, that he said that isn't jibing. I can really I, I can wait and watch and see and let, I think, actual events determine what it is that I'm going to write. And I think print reporters have a little bit more of that um, 
to do because generally print deadlines, especially for newspapers, are eight or nine o'clock at night. So you've got a little bit more time after a briefing to really process what happened and what was said and, and start making some phone calls and following up on any new information that might have come out. Okay. Does it sound okay? Um, and um, in the buildup to the to the war in Iraq, um, the, both the administration and the Pentagon were saying that you need a force in the area in order to uh, motivate Saddam's compliance with the UN. Mm -hmm. At what point, you know, what is the threshold of how many forces are, are needed? And at what point does that get exceeded? And then you you say, well, maybe they have a separate. Let me, let me wait for this. Uh, Can you finish your question? And I'll with, um, you know, was there any point where the mobilizations continued to happen that you thought, well, maybe they really are, their intention is to go to war as opposed to, as, as to wanting the consequence to be compliance with the United Nations right. inspectors? As as we watched the as I watched the mobilization for war, I don't think I ever doubted that there was going to be a war. Um, there was a lot of talk about how no decision has been made, but I, I don't I don't know. Maybe we're just too cynical, but all of the entire press corps at the Pentagon was just kind of looking at our watches and wondering when it was going to be. I don't, there was never any doubt. I think in any of our minds that it was an if. Um, I suppose there was an exit ramp um, that, in, in leading up to it, that if Saddam Hussein had done something differently and, and handed, I think, George Bush some sort of complete and total victory, uh, it, it might have been averted, but I don't think any of us ever thought that that mobilization was not leading to war. The sort of the, one of the amazing things about the U.S. military, though, is the ability to stop on a dime and to start on a dime. And so, just because you're sending people there doesn't mean there has to be a war. But I never had any doubts that that was the full intention and that that's what was going to happen. Did you see in the type of questionings to uh, with the television reporters that there was kind of this countdown to war? Oh sure, <laughs> the count countdown to war was wasn't that on every television screen? I, there was just never a sense that there was going to be anything other than a war. Um, and I mean, there's lots of there's lot, lots of reasons for it, but I mean, one of the things is you just costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time to to deploy that many people. It doesn't mean once you start a deployment you're going to necessarily go to war, but it's not a decision that they take lightly. So when they begin deploying people for something like that, it's not, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, are you scared now, are you scared now? It's, we're going to go to war, if they could be called back at the last second. But, I mean, that was the full intention. So, yeah, as far as, I mean, the impression that I had from watching TV was, oh, yeah, they think this is coming, too. Now, I think... Um did, on your beat, were you also covering the inspections or what the uh, El Barade or Blix were coming back to the UN and reporting, or was yeah. that outside of your constraints? I, I didn't. As a Pentagon reporter, I paid attention to the Blix report and to the um, and to the El Barade reports um, and to Colin Powell going and, and the information that was presented because it was background for my stories. You have to put in nut graphs that explain here's what who said what on, on which day, but I didn't cover it directly. We have. UN reporter and State Department reporters that that handled that. So mostly, I just concentrated on Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, the preparation for war, the um, the weaponry that was getting lined up, the numbers of people that were going over, and then you know potential scenarios for it and, and what you know what the big concerns were. And and there was you know one thing we wrote a lot about was urban warfare. There was a big concern that that was going to be a central part of the of the battle and a bloody one. So so that's what I focused on mostly. Um, but I find that if I stray too much from my area of expertise, if it can be called that, I, I run the risk of making stupid mistakes and I, I, I like to stick in, in what I know. So were, was there any amount of collaboration with the diplomatic correspondents or the political correspondents? Uh, not with me so much um, because... I'm sorry, I just... the. Uh, Question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't. I didn't collaborate a lot with our diplomatic correspondents. We talked usually once a day and sent a lot of emails. But, um, but, 
I, I personally am just sort of jealous of my copy. Um, I only put my name on things that I know for sure are true. And so that doesn't mean that I don't believe what everybody else is writing, but I check everything <laughs> before I use it in my copy. So, so for my purposes, I, I'm not comfortable collaborating on something um, unless I'm really in complete control of, of the end result of it. So I guess um, with the United Nations, was there a, a UN mandated deadline for uh, Iraqi disarmament? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Was there a UN mandated deadline? There was a UN mandated disarmament, but I think the whole issue and I could be wrong about this, but I think the whole issue that sort of drove the Bush administration crazy was that there wasn't this official deadline by which um, disarmament had to be proved. And I think one of the problems with that is sort of this old rule that you can't prove a negative. You can't prove that they don't have weapons. You can only prove that they do. And so I think that sort of amorphous ambiguity um, really made people a little nuts, is that despite claims of disarmament, you can never really prove they completely disarmed. You could only prove that they had not. And and again, maybe against the backdrop of that increased sense of vulnerability on, on the part of the Bush administration and probably much of the country, maybe that wasn't good enough anymore. It kind of took a, a like audit of your, of your look, uh, of your some of your articles that were on UPI, um, <laughs> pulling out some, <laughs> some stuff, and I just want to read some... Uh, some quotes and um, have you comment on them. Uh, and, and I don't know if I, it was a comprehensive, okay. you know, look. Cause I don't I'm know so nervous. I hate going back and reading my old stuff. I hate it. I always find stuff I want to change. Go okay, on. so on January 23rd, uh, 2003, you you say, time is running out, Wolf Woods asserted Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then also on March 11th, 03, you say, the United States and Britain are crafting a new draft resolution that would push back Ar Iraq's disarmament deadline for March 19th by a few days. Now, I guess this goes to, you know, what is the U.S. saying versus what the U.N. is saying? Mm -hmm. that, that, um, that disarmament deadline, I think that was the 48 hours, if I remember correctly, that was the 48-hour deadline that Bush had given to uh, Saddam Hussein. Are we talking about the right thing? Well, this was reported on March 11, 2003. Right. And so it was the, yeah... Yeah, it turns out that that didn't end up happening, I guess. <laughs> I don't even remember who my source was on that um, or where that came from. I guess I talked to somebody who I can't even remember. <laughs> it was a year uh, ago. I guess it, it's the, uh, it's a blur. Uh, what I see is kind of a blurring between what United States and Britain, Britain are saying are the mm -hmm. deadline versus what the UN is saying. I'm not sure that the UN ever came down with a deadline. It was the US that crafted a deadline so that they could go to war. Um, that sounds a little bit. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit incendiary. <coughs> Having made the decision that they believed that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, they wanted to draw a line in the sand, as it were, and say, do it by this time or, or you're done. And so that's what that March 19th deadline was about. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the UN, and I really haven't reviewed this stuff in a long time. My brains are like scrambled eggs after a year of this and um, but m my recollection of it is that the UN had multiple resolutions calling for the disarmament of Iraq and various iterations of, of those and then the United States came in and said by this date or we're going to war and it was just a way of ratcheting up pressure. Okay. Um, on August 20th, uh, I think in the uh, in 2002, you asked Donald Rumsfeld, this uh -huh. was before um, Cheney's speech on the 26th, yeah. he said, what makes a preemptive strike legal under international law? And he says, well, I'm not a lawyer, Pam, you know that. Yes. And then he, <laughs> he goes on, so um, kind of establishing that he's not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then he had two articles, though, um, one on December 3rd, 2003, where the title is, U.S. does not need approval for war, and the only person you quote is Rumsfeld. So... In that context, there was, you know, the he had said during that uh, report or that briefing, he said, "I'm not a lawyer, and I'm sure if you went to five lawyers and they read the thing, they would have five different opinions to, as to precisely what it may or may not mean." Mm -hmm. And 
this is, I, oh, I think what you're what so you're getting. I understand what you're getting at. And the article, the December article, which I don't remember um, because I've written a bazillion of them. But I think what that is an example of is getting an official on the records. This is what he said on this date that the United States doesn't need whatever it was that he said to go to war. I mean, that's. I guess um, when I look at that and I see the only person you're you're quoting is Rumsfeld. Mm -hmm. Did you think to ask? other lawyers since he's saying I'm not a lawyer and you're taking his lawyerly advice in mm -hmm. essence. Uh, I don't think I, I don't think in that sense that that's how I approached it. In that sense I was approaching it as this is a cabinet official, the, the Secretary of Defense, and this is what he's saying and, and marking it down as a, a as a marker and that this is what the administration is saying at this point. Um, I'm not sure if I wrote about it back in August when I asked that question and, and I think that probably would have been the time that I would have done it going into the the legal the, the legal case for preemptive strikes as a as a campaign I understand I understand the question and I think in pulling it out I can understand it sounds like you're concerned about that but but I think again this is a difference between doing it every day which is sometimes you don't always have it you don't always have an option of talking to five different people and let me say it this way my day-to-day -day job is to get them on the record for this is what they're saying and, and trying to explain this is what they're saying and this is why they're saying it. And then once or twice a week or longer, you have time to, to do what would essentially be an analysis or a feature. But I think that story would, would fall under the rubric of sort of breaking news and versus, versus a feature or an analysis, which, is, which does involve talking to a lot of different people and really getting into the meat of an issue. But we're just trying to get a cabinet secretary on the record saying this is what they said about this subject on this date. Then that's, I think, what that story is. So I guess in, in international law uh, realm, would, you know, were you following that debate as to whether they needed a second resolution or whether it would have been justified? Or I didn't follow the, I didn't follow the whole that that stuff um, as closely because I had my hands full with the deployment of three hundred thousand <laughs> troops. Okay, I, so, I just want to get when you say that stuff, international law versus the the deployment. Right so, yeah. when I mean when it came up, I'd, I'd really in order for us to I mean to to really talk about it. If if you want to look at my record, we could go in and I can pull up every story I did, and we can we can sort of go through and do it a, a complete look at it. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it just sort of falls into this: is that sometimes you have uh, the time and the interest on in doing an analysis or a feature, which is longer, and other times you write down what they say, and you're not writing down what they say because it's the truth. You're writing down what they say because they're government official and they and they have said it, and and it's my job to get them on the record. Um, if you think of it, I guess this way: the 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 great. Um, reporters who do you know, great analysis or great investigative work, when they go into LexisNexis, what they need are, st are stories like that, where they can say, Rumsfeld said on this date, X, Y, and Z, then they can take that and spin it into a much larger piece for a magazine or a Sunday piece in the, in the newspaper where they really dig into the issues. But when I'm dealing with you know, word limits of, of 800 words or 500 words, depending on, on what I've been assigned that day, you know, that, that determines amount, the amount of, of detail you can get into. So I guess in that light, how do you see the, the influence of the White House in, in setting the agenda of what to cover? Um, the White well, I was at the White House for six months, and I was I was pretty low on the totem pole, um, but I see it in a in a couple of ways. I mean, they have a bully pulpit there, and I, I've, it's sort of like a fire hose of information where they can just because it's the White House, and Rumsfeld can do this too, and Powell can do it too, anything that they say ends up being all over the television, you know, pulled on C-SPAN, live feeds, whatever, and so they can really get messages out there um, in, in unfiltered ways. Uh, so they've got, they've got a huge advantage uh, over that because you have just, you know, a few, a handful of reporters that have the sources and the, the backing of their bosses to take a few days or to take a month or take two months to really dig into what it is that they're saying. So, I mean, when you, when you talk about sort of media versus the government and, and sort of this clash, I think that the government almost always has a, 
has an advantage because it takes a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy. And when you pick to focus on one thing, that means you're not going to be focusing on 50 other things that are in your beat. And so that's a decision that your editors have to okay because it means that some other stuff is not going to get the amount of attention that it also deserves. So I guess my summary is that the White House has a bully pulpit and a fire hose of information and and reporters can sort of pick at, pick at the edges. It's only when everybody jumps on one story that I think um, big changes can big changes happen or that you can shift an administration stance or you can create enough public outrage if, if outrage is, is called for to, to make some of those changes. But, but then the, then reporters get you know um, accused of pack journalism, which is supposedly a bad thing. So so I don't, I don't know if that's an answer to your question. Yeah, that is. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when you um, look back during that, that time period um, from August 26, 2002 up mm -hmm. to March 19, 2002, mm -hmm. when all this, do you see um, things that the press could have done better or? Uh, yeah, I think for sure there's a lot that we could have done better. Um, From my, from my little desk at the Pentagon, I know that we asked that central question at every briefing, which was at almost every briefing anyway, which was, has the threat changed between September 10th and September 12th in Iraq? And, and the answer that we got was pretty consistent, which is the threat hasn't necessarily changed, but the feeling of vulnerability about that has. Um, I, I went through that build-up period without any illusion that that Iraq was any more of a threat on that day than it had been um, for the last you know 12 years and and I think if I were to if I were to say who has more responsibility in this I mean certainly I think you know, the White House, it was their decision and, and their reading of intelligence, but I also think Congress really let the ball drop. There's only so much that reporters can do when you're dependent on someone to, as I said, I think earlier, to compromise themselves professionally and, and potentially um, wind up in jail for sharing classified information that might contradict, if, it, if that information was available, that might contradict um, what the White House or what the Pentagon was saying officially. So unless you have those people that are willing to do that, you're kind of you're sort of stuck. You can ask all the questions that you want, but you know it, it's you know it's not journalism to to get out there and say, well, we asked these questions and they gave us their standard answers, but we think that's wrong. That's you know that's for columnists to do. But as a news reporter, I actually have to have something that proves that they're wrong before I can before I can write it. Um, and every once in a while, you can sort of delve into analysis and you can have experts saying. You know, well, this you know seems weird. This, but, but with these guys especially, I mean, they are, they're right on top of you. And if you don't have Rumsfeld in particular, if you don't have facts at your command that contradict what they're saying, they just cut you off. And so, digging up those facts is difficult. Um, so, so, that said, I think that maybe um, I, I would have been interested in seeing more questioning from Congress because people in Congress actually have the security clearances to read the intelligence um, and, and to question it better. And they also are, you know, sort of notoriously leaky and they could have shared some of that information with reporters too, but we're dependent on our sources. Uh, one of the substantive problems that, ha substantive questions that hasn't been answered yet in the lead up to the war is, was the intelligence bad or was the intelligence ignored? And and I'm not sure that we, I'm not sure that we know that answer yet. Does the blame lie, blame? I mean, that's such a loaded word. <coughs> does the responsibility for how the intelligence was handled does that lie with the CIA, which didn't have good enough human intelligence sources, um, or does the responsibility lie with the Pentagon and the White House, who, for whatever reason, were inclined to go to war with Iraq and therefore read what intelligence came across through this prism. Um, I think people, a lot of people are now sort of believing, leaning, uh, leaning this way towards the, the prism answer, but I don't know that we have those answers and I don't think I could sit down and write an article today that said that 
that it was them versus them. More stuff is more stuff is coming out. I think with the 9/11 Commission and and with Richard Clark's book. Um, so okay. eventually, maybe that information will be out there. But I don't think that I don't think we know it yet. I think people have ideas, but you know, I would prove it, and I have to prove it. I'm in the business of proving. Right. <coughs> um, the uh, there's a number of, uh, during the build-up, there's a number of times when you're reporting on defectors and scientists and the importance mm -hmm. of them. Can you talk about why they're so important, defectors? The defectors? Yeah. From Iraq. Right. Well, for um, specifically, you know, with uh, Rumsfeld saying, if you go back and look at the history of inspections in Iraq, the reality is things have been found not by discovery but through defectors. Right. It's um, the, the reason that the administration was was so, I think one of the reasons why the administration was so uncomfortable with the inspections process is that in the same way that reporters rely on people with inside information to share it with them, the administration felt like the only way that they could get the information onto where to find this stuff would be um, to have insiders share with them that this bomb had been produced or this chemical had been produced and here it is. It's just, um, it would be like, I don't know, it's sort of like putting a reporter in a room with a bazillion filing cabinets and saying, you know, there's one document in here and you have six months to go and find it. Much better to have someone that says, and here's the document. So I think that's that's where the that's where the white that's where Rumsfeld was coming from on that. And the idea that you wanted um, the idea that you wanted defectors uh, was sort of wrapped up in the negotiations or, or, in, or in the the wish that the United States wanted, which was to be able to remove um, physically remove scientists from Iraq along with their families in order to interview them in hopes that outside the uh, pressure arena of Saddam Hussein's government um, they would be able to give up some some information that they wouldn't be able to give otherwise and that inspectors might never be able to find on their own. So, well, Back in 1995 there was Hussein Kamal who you know, kind of led them mm -hmm. to the biological um, chemical weapons programs and he was a very reliable source and then on uh, March or April, February 24th of 2003, Newsweek had broke the story that he had actually said that we're all destroyed. Mm -hmm. Did you see that report come through? I, you know, I don't remember, and I'm probably not the best person to ask on that. Um, I just I don't recall. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. It's um, been a year and my brain, as I said, is scrambled eggs. Okay. Do um, I recall? Um, I'll, let me stew on that one in the back of my head, and I'll. It's on the twenty fourth of February, and Newsweek broke it. I just need to, yeah, I, that he said, and he was the one that said, he, he said yeah. we have biological weapons. That they destroy it. Yeah, well, in ninety five, he but said he, that we, was out, and then Cheney was quoting him. Right, oh, and Cheney, Cheney, Don't Cheney get me was on Cheney was quoting, you know, on August twenty sixth, mm -hmm. you know, and even George Bush was quoting him by right. name. Hussein right. Kamel, right. and then it came out on the 24th of February right. that he had also said that they destroyed them all, and that the transcript was leaked and out there, but no one covered it. But Newsweek covered it. Newsweek covered it, and then Reuters covered it, but then mm -hmm. it disappeared completely. Mm -hmm. And it was a that, it was a piece of information that was right. a red flag to the fairness and accuracy reporting, the, mm -hmm. the anti-war movement, but it was. You know, it, it wasn't picked up in the New York Times, Washington Post, and I was just wondering if. Uh, you know, what, I don't, I don't, I don't remember a whole lot about that. And um, but let me say, this one thing is that one of the problems that you have in journalism, um, with the, the mechanism mechanisms of it, is if you get a document that's really hot, um, that no one else can get. You can report on it, but if other people can't get their hands on it, it doesn't end up having legs. What's going to have to happen is for, see Reuters as a wire service can pick up without losing any pride um, anything that any um, any newspaper puts out. That, that's one of their jobs to sort of collect the big news of the day. But for the New York Times or the Washington Post or another big paper to be able to pick up that story and run with it, they would most likely need to have that document themselves, and if they can't get it, then the story dies. Well, in this particular case, it was posted on the internet oh, the okay. next day. Then I have so, nothing to say. <laughs> but okay, <laughs> I um, don't know. I really don't remember, and and shame on me. I mean, this is it. I wonder. You know, I wonder if I. I just. I. I don't. I'm, I don't remember. I shouldn't say this. I just. I just don't remember. Okay, it's fine. Um, 
uh, the no-fly zones. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain the purpose of the no-fly zones and then how they fit in with the UN? Yeah, actually the no-fly zones have a really kind of nutty history. Um, the shorthand version of them is that they were these UN-created no-fly zones. Not true. What they were um, were were U.S. and British and, Tur and a couple of other countries, France initially, um, and Turkey obviously, uh, there was their interpretation of a U.N. resolution that said the Kurdish people have to be protected. Um, I, if I recall correctly, it was, there was, there's two different U.N. resolutions, and one of them dealt with, maybe the first one was in the south with the Shiites after the slaughter, after, um, in, the, in the uprising after, after the Gulf War, um, where at least 100,000 Shiites were killed by Saddam Hussein's forces when they sort of rose up against him after the U.S. there sort of said, you might want to do that, and then failed to, failed to come in behind him. Um, <clears throat> and then there was a second resolution that said, and the, and the Kurdish people should be protected as well. And the U.S. looked at that and saw a, an opportunity to interpret that the way in, in a way that actually ended up being of great benefit certainly to the US military and that was to run no fly zones over the northern and the southern swath of the country of, of, of Iraq uh, France after 98 uh, I believe dropped off its support it, it wasn't flying fighter jets in support of the no fly zones which basically it was sort of no fly no drive zones basically they were just sort of up there monitoring for any Iraqi planes there were always very very few um, I, I'm certainly fewer than like two dozen, I think, Iraqi planes ever scrambled during those times. Um, and, and then also in a no-drive zone, so on the ground they would keep an eye out for Iraqi troop movements. At any rate, so the, the no-fly zones then existed as a, not as a function of a UN resolution, but as an interpretation of a UN resolution. And, um, and they were pretty much day in, day out, or almost every other day. Uh, there was one point where they had to stop during the Kosovo War because the U.S., particularly in the North, the U.S. had to divert a lot of its planes to go up there. But basically, the military benefit um, that the generals were very fond of talking about was they did more damage to uh, Saddam Hussein's surface, um, to air missiles and, and air defense program during that time than, than they were able to during the entire Persian Gulf War when they used all these munitions. Um, Iraq didn't resist the uh, no-fly zones until after December 1998, which was Operation Desert Fox, which was launched um, in the Clinton administration as a, uh, as a punishment to Saddam Hussein for failing to provide unfettered access to uh, a new set of UN arms inspectors. Um, and I think that was in November. And then the arms inspectors uh, left, and then the U.S. launched this strike. So that's the <laughs> more, yeah, than, more than you yeah, care to know. Right. Well, Something think, that I actually I wrote the, a great uh, deal about. The, uh, yeah, I yeah. noticed the, the critical <laughs> distinction, I think, is that they weren't officially sanctioned by right. the U.N. Oh, so I said the right thing. Right. And okay. that, <laughs> yes. do, you, do you see they weren't, that You know, the they media? weren't sanctioned. Uh, I didn't see that in the media, but but it's also I think it's not quite fair to say that because that I found it I found it really when I learned that I thought well golly that's interesting and I included it in almost every story I wrote because I thought that that you know that's not getting a lot of attention but it's also in in another sense it's sort of a diplomatic splitting of hairs because the UN had an opportunity had had ten years of an opportunity to pass a resolution saying we don't support these no fly zones so so. The idea that you know that it was some sort of vast conspiracy to keep it quiet, well, kinda. But also, I mean, it's a complicated subject that I learned about. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, sometime in the last six years, I really dug into it and said, let's see about these resolutions. But what would have gotten more reporters on it was had the UN done anything about it. Had the UN said, no, that's not how we how we envision these resolutions being enforced. So, so to blame the media for not focusing on that is, is fair, but you also have to realize that the media is, is driven by news, by things happening. And well, that's not the, great, uh, but, the, the but context, that, is what, that is what happens. I think the context is that when you have administration officials saying these no-fly zones, it's a breach, they're right. flying at our planes, right. they're not sanctioned by the UN, and it's, it's being ignored in that context that, mm -hmm. well, there's controversy. Although, but the problem is, is that there wasn't controversy. There's controversy in the minds of people who 
were against it, but there was not controversy in the UN about it. And since this was an action that the US and Great Britain and France and I think Denmark and a couple of other countries took as an interpretation of a UN resolution and it wasn't opposed by the UN, there's not a controversy. I think it's an interesting bit of information and one that I tried to include a lot because I thought, golly, that's an interesting little fact. But to call it a controversy, I, I don't necessarily think it is. Had anti-war activists made it into a big deal, then it would have been a controversy and it would have gotten more... Um, I, th I think an interesting thing that I have found in, in, in talking with a lot of people is that there's a lot of blame for the media for somehow, you know, not doing our jobs. And everyone seems to think that the media's job is to reflect their concerns and their controversies. And in some cases, that is. But I really put a lot of the, um, the responsibility for what, I put all the responsibility really for what happens in this country on the people in this country. If people aren't willing to educate themselves and stand up and, and say things, um, then you, you can't blame the media for doing it. And yes, we have an incredibly important role in educating people about these things, but if you also want an objective media that's going to give you fair and true information, that doesn't really jibe with the idea of a media that's out there trying to fan flames and people who might then end up protesting government programs. Um, there's, there are plenty of conservative and liberal publications that do have an agenda whose job it is to do that, but when you expect the mainstream media to be doing that, um, I, I think that that's not really fair. I think that the American people have a responsibility to decide for themselves, and if they think that what the government is doing is just fine, then they're not going to be protesting, and they're not going to be writing letters, then we get the government that we deserve, right? Well, I think the, the issue comes in is um, a lot of the citizens don't necessarily have access to be able to challenge some of these issues. And, and access, and, and, you mean by what? Um, to sources, uh, inside sources that wouldn't otherwise talk to them. <coughs> right. National security structure are going to be talking off But the I mean, you're imagining that that we do. <laughs> and I can promise you that I don't have anybody in the National Security Council that's talking to me. Um, I have, you know, 10, 20 people that will talk to me when it serves their interests. Um, but it's, it's not as if reporters are sitting on these Rolodexes where we snap our fingers and they come to us. It's great stories are the product of, of hard work and a lot of passion and luck in many cases, or in also finding somebody whose agenda needs to be furthered and, and who has access to information. So, so this, this, I, I think this, I, I think that the concern that the media is not representing the American public's views there, there's something to be said for that, but I also think that the American public needs to express its views a little better. Well, I think when you say that you, they don't have access, I think if you look at Jonathan Landay's or mm -hmm. um, you know Warren Strobel's mm -hmm. contacts that they were able to establish right. over many years, yes. you know over they were able years. to dig out a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Jonathan and uh, Jonathan is one of the great reporters in Washington, and. Um, and then I think, but this, and, and this takes us back to the difference between beat reporting and investigative reporting. In beat reporting, you're responsible for generating copy every day that's accurate and that's true and that um, responds to that day's headlines or helps make the next day's headlines. Um, and in investigative reporting, you don't have necessarily that daily deadline to worry about. Um, and so you're able to just sort of dig around and see what's up and take people out for lunch and talk to them and become friends with them and sort of check in. Um, so there's there's more time to there's more t there's more time to do it. And so, but they can't do their job unless there are beat reporters who are also writing down. This is what they said on this date. This is what somebody else said on this date. So that there's and the the two kind of mesh together. I if if the thesis here is that the United States needs more vigorous journalism. I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, vigorous journalism is hard to do, and it's expensive to do, and and you know, and it's 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 like a teacup in a in an ocean though, because you have two or three reporters or five reporters at big newspapers that are doing the work, 
and then you have, you know, the I think that there's it, Bush administration officials yesterday had something like I think the Washington Post reported um, it, it, as they were trying to sort of go on and counter the uh, claims that were in Richard Clark's recently released book, um, 15 different interviews on television in one day. So they just, they, government, I have been awed by how powerful the government can be when it chooses to. And, um, and really struck with this particular administration as the, the unity of vocabulary. Um, I think a, a communication message goes out each day saying this is, these are the big things on our plate today and these are the words that we're going to use to describe them. And, it, and that, that is a very difficult thing to counter. And I think that people who, people who believe that the media isn't doing enough to sort of take apart what it is that the Bush administration is saying um, don't I I, th I think they don't necessarily understand the business which is that it's hard to take apart that stuff and that yeah. you're relying on great sources and you can't make them talk to you they have to want to talk to you so I, it's just it's just it's a, it's a really hard they're powerful and it's really hard to counter them it can be done but it's on, you know, on issues that are sort of few and far between and that are helped along by stuff like the 9-11 Commission or the Coal Commission or, or things like that. So when you say the business, you mean it's, it's cost too much to have investigative reporters? It, it, it would be too expensive to have someone looking at this and that's why there's not enough vigorous terms? I don't think it's quite as simple as, as an economics question, but if you are, if you're a newspaper or if you're a news organization and you have, and you have to put out a newspaper every day. If you had an entire staff of investigative reporters, you'd be putting out a monthly magazine, <laughs> if that. You can't generate the copy that you need to generate and do adequate coverage of what's going on, you know, to say that there was a fire here and that this guy, you know, the DC water is full of lead and things are happening and that is news. And so you have to, you have to put resources towards covering that. And then, and then you have some resources for investigative, and so I, what, I what agree, can you, have both? you can have both. You can have both, and I agree that that investigative journalism is is the more valuable of the two in the long term. But it it's it's, it's the more valuable of the two when you think of you know the of sort of really truth squatting what the government is saying and doing, but. You know, for Joe on the street who just wants to know if DC water is safe to drink today, you also need the Daily Reporter. So I don't know. I think maybe you need to talk to editors about how yeah. they make that decision because um, that's that's way beyond me. I just sit at the Pentagon and. Do well, I guess thing. from my perspective, I have access to the internet and I can go read the sure. transcripts directly. Sure. Um, with you know, as of five years ago, LexisNexis right. had a different influence on the business. Mm -hmm. But now, anyone has access to the transcript. So, t from my perspective, I see that the journalists are the ones who have to be asking the questions in the in the briefings. Mm -hmm. And so, it's a proxy to being able to challenge them and not just dictating what they say. I'm sorry. Repeat the last part. What do you uh, mean challenge them it? on on issues and 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 ask them the questions or, you know, if you'd be able to say, okay, aluminum tubes, for example, mm -hmm. on uh, October 4th, you reported, this is kind of weird, the CIA is saying that there's a debate. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from the coverage that I saw, I didn't see any, any other reports on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a nugget. Yeah, it is a nugget. Um, but it's also, I, I think that the difference between what you're, where you're coming from and where I'm coming from on that is that once I've asked Rumsfeld about those um, aluminum tubes and he said, I don't know, that's a CIA issue, I'm sort of stuck unless I can be pulled off my daily beat to go now cover the CIA every day or, so it's, so when you see, when you, when you read the transcripts and are frustrated because your questions aren't being asked the way that you want to ask them, um, 
it could be journalists are lazy, journalists are not prepared. It could also be they've already asked that question and have found that they're just getting to a brick wall. They're not getting any information. And there is a there is a great deal of work that goes on outside of the briefings. The briefings is where you get people on the record, um, but it's phone calls that you make and conversations that you have in the hallway and emails that you get from people that are offering you information that you know make up the bulk of the quality work that you do. And the briefings while being an excellent fire hose for the administration and a great opportunity for reporters to get the official line and every once in a while a bit of information or or you know actually move a story along then I, there's just I, I do understand the frustration um, but if I don't have anything more beyond these aluminum tubes you know there's a question about them the aluminum tubes I can't, there's nowhere I can go with that if I don't have anything beyond the fact that there's a question about it. If I have an official document, I have something original that says, yeah, these things aren't real, then, then I've got a story. But, you know, there's only just, you just, you hit a brick wall and that's that. So I guess for the, is it, okay, and the, the constraints of your beat, you're covering the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and you're also national security, so that, does, does that not include the CIA or NSA? I don't or? do the CIA on a daily basis. Um, uh, but I do talk to them periodically, um, and I know one or two people at the NSA. And and when I when for my main work, I I need to go there. I do, um, and and ideally, I would have a situation where I could cover all of that. But I think what you'll find if if you go to the big the big papers or even larger wire services that they have people specifically dedicated to national intelligence, and it's it's a whole beat unto itself. So, so that's another beat. That's reporter. another beat, yeah. Okay. That's but, I guess and we don't, for, for I, UPI, you. I don't think we have someone um, dedicated to that. We just, we don't have the money for it. Okay, so I you think. don't have a... An, I don't think we have an intelligence okay. reporter. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out, like, Yeah, I don't think we do. I, are. Um, I don't, ha I don't really have any firm boundaries, um, but I don't, I don't have, I can call whoever I want, essentially, if it's important for my story. Okay, so Bill Harlow at CIA, you sure. need to talk to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see, the, the back to the no-fly zones. Mm -hmm. Did you see that there there seemed to be a different intention than the consequence of, or a different intention of trying to eliminate the air defense? Did you ever get the sense that this has nothing to do with the uh, um, repression of the... Uh, of the civilian population that they're mm -hmm. using this as a pretext to kind of eliminate for other purposes? Um, you know what? N I, no, I don't think so. And I think that uh, the evidence to the evidence to support the idea that the no-fly zones were well-intentioned, um, it's, it's, it, from, from my mind, it's pretty persuasive. Um, the, the military was almost never bombed anything. Um, and was just really policing the skies, flying circles in the skies. It was, it was, it was, it, it was a big issue for the Air Force, who was complaining about this, saying that you know we're, we have these guys up there putting hours and hours on planes, never shooting anything, never doing anything. They come down, they still have to fly and, and be trained again. So it was a it was a real strain on them. Um, so it wasn't until December '98 that Saddam Hussein's people started firing at the forces that were that were flying these. So that's when they began doing the, um, when they began taking apart the, the air defenses. Um, and, and I think if you look at what happened, particularly in the north of Iraq with the Kurds, I mean, they, they, were, they were in a really different situation than the rest of Iraq. And, and it did have, an, I would say, a, a, an overarching benefit. I think it's indisputable. I know that there were you know, some civilians that were killed I'm sure that there were civilians that were killed. I don't know that there were um, during the course of, of those operations. Um, the, but the economic and and sort of peaceful benefit to the Kurdish people in northern Iraq. I mean, if you've have you been to Salamina or anywhere up there? I mean, it's it's a very different situation. They they've set up, it's peaceful and and prosperous, and they've set up a really nice system for themselves. So it had a benefit to them. It did protect the Kurds, and they were able to set up kind of a separate society, autonomous, away from the reach of Saddam Hussein. Um, so... Well, I guess the, specifically, you know, when, when you report on stuff saying that U.S. and British aircraft enforcing no-flying were shot upon more than 125 times, mm -hmm. or 
uh, you know, they only fired after coming under fire from anti-aircraft artillery. And each of these attacks would carry out after Iraqi forces somehow threatened Russian aircraft. These are all statements that According are coming. According to Central Command. Right. Correct. And, you know, there, is there any way to verify them? Um, they're the only source on it. I mean, how would you verify it? Would you say just don't report it? Well, that I mean, that's the the, the question of you know. Well, that's if, so. If that's they, my question to you. Put right, yourself in my position. Do you not report it? So, uh, a, a U.S. The U.S. has struck the radar at Al Kut. Okay, they say that that's what happened. Do you report that? I would report that it's unverified, but that's what they said. It's unverified that they struck at Al Kut. Because how do you know? But the idea. I, you're really getting into an odd semantic argument, which is you say this is this is how you write it. Y you know, F-16 struck uh, an Iraqi radar. Um, let it roll for. Uh, sure. Uh, Twenty-two seconds. 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 Twen
first became clear, I, I remember the briefings and, and the admiral that was telling us, and now retired admiral, who was a, a spokesman for the Pentagon, and we had a long discussion about this. Um, so about the idea that there wasn't necessarily a, a cause and effect relationship between mm -hmm. what happened. Um, and and, and I, I think I would agree with what seems to be your thesis maybe now, is that those details often got lost as the stories got older. And I would think that's that's true. Right, yeah, that's what just, you know, if, if someone's doing that every day, I could see, and you don't want to be over redundant saying, sourcing every little thing. And so, it, it you know, when the dateline's in Washington, D.C., and it's being reported like that, you kind of assume that it, you're taking the word. But mm -hmm. it's not always made explicitly clear that that's the case. Well, I, I, as, as far as I'm concerned, as a news professional, if I say Central Command said something, I'm saying that Central Command said it, and I'm not independently verifying it. If I say Central Command said something, and then in an interview following the operation with the pilot who flew the plane, then it becomes clear that now there's two sources, or on and on and on. So, so I think that the argument that you have is one with sort of standard ways of news writing that you think um, maybe don't do enough to spur doubt in the or spur skepticism in the in the minds of readers, and. And I think that it would be, um, I think that one could make a really interesting argument on the other side that if you had your preferred tagline that this information could not be verified, that would seem to be journalism very biased against the government. Um, and I think that the idea of just saying, this is the person that said it, and I'm leaving it up to you what to do with it, is a, probably a reasonable middle ground, as opposed to saying, let me just do the example here. F-16 struck a radar in Al-Qut, no civilians were hurt, versus F-16 struck a radar in Al-Qut, no civilians were hurt, according to U.S. Central Command, versus an F-16 struck a radar in Al-Qut, Central Command said, they also claimed that no civilians were hurt, this could, information could not be verified. Tell me which one of those is the most objective, which one is not pushing some kind of a, an agenda. It's not this one because that one's pushing the idea that the military didn't hurt anybody and we know it to be <coughs> true. And it's not this one because that's the idea that we think they're lying and we just want you to understand it. It's this one. This is what they said happened. That's all we can do. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me see if there's uh, maybe one or two more questions. Um, uh, let me just throw out a sure. couple of things quick. On uh, March uh, 2nd, 2003, did you... Uh, <laughs> You're killing me with this. Did you hear uh, anything? I mean, this is the Catherine Gunn the story that broke. Um, Catherine Gunn was the one who leaked the, okay. NSA, the the memo saying that the NSA is spying on the UN. This right. was on March second, two thousand three. It was right. in the Observer, and she was arrested the next week. Mm -hmm. Was that on your radar screen? At it all? wasn't on my radar screen at all. Um, I'm sorry, the, just a, no, yeah, I understand. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, and actually, I didn't know that she's um, that she was arrested, or did I? Um, I think that the reasons that it wasn't on my screen were the re it was uh, it was the UN, it was Britain, it was a British paper, and I didn't have any way of adding anything to it. The most that we could do with it would be to pick it up, and I imagine that we probably put out you know two or three hundred word thing, but that's I, that's not my job. If I can't add something to the story or independently verify or, or move it along or discredit it, then it's. There's not much for me to do with it. Otherwise, then I just become, you know, a repeater of somebody else's work, and I'd rather do my own work. So even if that memo came into your office today saying the NSA is spying on the UN illegally, what um, would you do with that? That's a good question. You'd have to have something new to report. Uh, it would probably be an opportunity to say, to, to maybe go back into her case and figure out where she stands in the legal system, which I have no idea, and then you sort of go back over and saying this is what the memo was and it was obtained by UPI. Well, what I was, I guess, you know, it was published and then you know, on the internet and mm -hmm. it was out there and, you know, is that outside of your bounds to say if the NSA, which, I mean, after the war it came mm -hmm. out that they were. You I know, mean, you're also, you're putting, so. an, you're putting a lot of... Um, Hindsight bias? Well, no, no, actually, I'd say you're putting a lot of trust in, in stuff that gets posted on the internet. Um, that stuff can be toyed with, um, the, you know, it could be changed, so I'm not necessarily, 
unless I see that you know something, in, unless I have another way of verifying that something is an actual document versus a document that maybe began life as one thing and certain things were changed. Um, I'm not just going to pull it off the internet and say that this is true. You well, have if they to have take a it. name, that, in this in particular instance, mm -hmm. they, they had a name, Frank Caza, that was a, a, that they had confirmed was an employee at the mm -hmm. NSA, mm -hmm. and that they had this memo, and that they had uh, Gregory Bamford just look at it and say, yeah, it looks like it probably is. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just posted raw, they had mm -hmm. done some journalism on it. Right. I didn't, yeah, I didn't follow it closely enough to say, but I mean, those are my, those are my initial concerns. And I guess it, Again, this is all sort of fits into your thesis that for reasons of laziness or unprofessionalism or media bias, huge things were ignored. Um, and, and I think that I think that I think that that is there's there's some truth to that. there's there's also truth to all the other stuff, which is incredibly cluttered news environment. Um, reporters have a bias towards their own stuff, towards the stuff that they themselves generate. That's what they trust. Um, so I, there's, I mean, there's there's lots of reasons for it. It doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the media is blameless in in ignoring these things. But also there are other levels of media that you, I imagine, that you'll also talk about, like which is the place for a lot of that stuff bringing together all these different things or magazines and where people again have time to really craft something but to expect to expect a newspaper or a news reporter to pick something up and to give it legs you also have to understand that there needs to be new information with it every day otherwise it doesn't have any legs I mean that's that's just what happens that is sort of the, the basis of news it has to be new and you're speaking as from the perspective of a beat reporter um, right? or if I'm speaking for as a magazine reporter, I could if I were a magazine reporter, I could take that and do something with it and blow it into a larger story and saying, you know, here's all the case of stuff. And even as a even as a beat reporter, I could do that, but that's a one day story. I can do that one time. And unless I have something new on that NSA memo, I'm done with it. Or unless she gets out of jail or she gets killed in jail or whatever happens, unless it's new, nothing happens and, and that's actually sort of the brilliance of the White House is that they can get on there every day and say something just a tiny little bit new and then that commands the headlines news there's the root word of news is new so if it's new then we write about it and if it's not new then we figure well pick up my story yesterday and read that one because it's gonna say the exact same thing today unless I have something new okay, okay. great let me see if there's any other questions Grilling is done here. So, um, just uh, <coughs> uh, one last, you know, like retrospective. When you look back on this time period, what would you have done differently? Um, I haven't really had a chance to think about that, and I would actually need to go back, I think, and really review my stuff and see if I felt like I left some holes. Um, I, I, I think I feel pretty comfortable that I often included the nut graph or the, the explaining paragraph um, that talked about Rumsfeld's discussion of the idea of feeling a vulnerability versus a, a new level of threat because um, I felt that like that was important. If I'd had more more time, which means not a requirement to cover the what was going on every day with with new deployments and the, and the work that they were doing. Then um, then I mean I I, I I could have done more analysis and more synth synthesis of what was going on and, and dig around and really dig up all the other stuff. But again, within the constraints of my job, I feel feel pretty comfortable with what I did which was to say here's what they said and here's why they're saying it and you know I feel I feel very strongly that my job at the Pentagon is if I don't have information to counter what they say is to find out why they're saying it um, to go beyond what it is they're saying and get to why why would you do this why wouldn't you do that and so and and I think I have a 
I, I have a strong record on, on that, and I, and I feel comfortable with that. Um, I think it would be great to be, you know, a real great investigative reporter, and and, uh, and maybe one day I will, but I need, I need some better sources. <laughs> if somebody could help me with that, that'd be great.